Good morning, everybody. They tell a story, an anecdote, about, I may have even shared it at one of the shiurim, I don't recall. There was a, a rabbi, a very innocent man, who would sit up nights and learn. And one night, he was sitting and learning three o'clock in the morning. And as you know, in every Jewish shtetl, in every Jewish city, there was what they called a shtot ganev. The local thief. Everybody has to make a living some way. You got to put bread on the table, support your wife and children. And his occupation was, he's the ganev, he would steal. He would do it with decency, with sensitivity. He wouldn't take more than he needs. For the week's wage, he would go in, take what he needs, support his wife and children, and move on till next week. And so one night he decided that this is the week he's going to go to the Rav's house and take what he needs from the rabbi's house. How do you get into the house? So Baruch Hashem, the home's at chimneys. You crawl in through the chimney, you slide down the chimney, you land wherever the chimney opens up in the home, you do your work and you go on. Little did he know that the Rav was sitting up and learning Gemara, and the chimney's opening was in the study of the rabbi. So as the Ganav, as the thief slides down, he lands in the study of the Rav, decorated and adorned by all of the lovely black and white and charcoal of the chimney, and he's standing there like they say in Yiddish, we are on Hashayna, on Hashayna after uh, it struck a few times, and he's standing there in front of the Rav, Kechap the Ganav, they caught the Ganav red hand. But the rabbi who was learning Gemara, a very pure, innocent person, sees him. He says, Ah, Reb Chaim, Reb Chaim, what brings you to my home at three o'clock in the morning? He says, Rebbe, Echab Shaila. Rebbe, I came to ask a Shaila, I came to ask a question. He says, Wow. This must be an urgent Shiloh. If 3 o'clock a.m. is not too early or too late for you to show up with this Shiloh. Reb Chaim, sure, what's the Shiloh? He says, Rebbe, the Shiloh is, wie kriegt man von dann und heraus? Rebbe, the question is, how does one get out of this situation? <laughs> I open with this anecdote because <laughs> that's my question today before the Shia. We began exploring in this series of Sunday morning classes the question of whether we have free choice. The question known in philosophy as determinism. Are we, is our behavior, our lifestyle, our belief system, our actions predetermined or not? The Ur Sameach in Hilchis Tshuva where the Rambam addresses this dedicates a few pages, usually Dar Sameach writes briefly, but he dedicates a few sides, a few pages to discuss this, and at one point he says, this question is like the blanket that's too short. You know, it's a cold winter night, and you're freezing, and you have a blanket, you want to cover your head, but then your legs are exposed. So you want to cover your legs, and your head is exposed. He says, you pull it this way, and another part becomes exposed. You pull it the other way, another part becomes exposed. Of course, relating to the major contradiction, the way it was presented in Jewish philosophy and in other philosophical systems in the Middle Ages, the question was, does God know the future? And if God knows the future, is his knowledge absolutely accurate? And if his knowledge is absolutely accurate, it means 
that he can't be wrong. And if he can't be wrong, it means that my behavior has been predetermined because if he knows it before it happened, so I must follow that routine. And if I must follow that routine, it means I have no choice. This is the question known in Hebrew as Yediyah and Bechira, divine knowledge versus human free choice. And last week, last, last year, series number one, we explored some of the topic from the perspective of the Jewish philosophers in the Middle Ages. And it, our Sameach is making the point that if you pull it this way, you can't get it this way. And if you pull it the other way, you can't get it this way. In other words, either God knows or we have free choice. And yet, the primary response and answer that has been most accepted by most of the Jewish thinkers and the Mepharshim and the commentators has been articulated by the great 16th century rabbi of Saloniki, Rabbi Moshe al Mashinino, quoted in Medrash Shmuel by the 17th century great uh, rabbi and Kabbalist of Tzvas, Rabbi Shmuel di Uzida, from the students of the Arizal in his commentary, Medrash Shmuel, who on Pirkei Avis, of his Perugimel, where Rabbi Akiva says, Hakel Tzofi Varushus Nesuna, everything is seen in advance, and yet, Free choice is granted to every individual to live their life according to their mental choices. And uh, Moishal Mashenino quoted in Medrash Shmuel, quoted and explained in Taisvis Yomtev by Rabbi Yomtev Lippmann Heller, a student of the Marami Prague, who has a commentary on Mishnayis, and the answer in brief presented by them and many more is that Hashem's knowledge is accurate and absolute, but it's a result from your choice. It's not that our choices are a result of God's knowledge, what we will do. God's knowledge of what I'm going to do is a result of my choice because he sees the future as though it was past or as though it's happening in the present. The metaphor I gave is if I am watching a video of a very dramatic and exciting football game, and I'm watching a great hero of mine, a celebrity of mine, watching football, uh, playing football. I'm seeing it on the video screen. I know what his next step is going to be in the game, what is going to be the next move. Nobody will say that my knowledge is forcing that player to take that next move, not because my knowledge is inaccurate or my knowledge is not absolute, it's just an estimation of what he might do based on my knowledge of his history of how he plays football. Even if my knowledge is absolutely accurate and absolute, you will all understand that my knowledge of what he's going to do, which is absolute, is not forcing him or coercing him to take that move. Why? So the obvious answer is, it's not really a question and answer, because he played already. And I have been told by somebody who has a, the game what the next move was. I'm watching the video. I know what he did already. And therefore I know what the next move is because he already made the next move. So I know what he's going to choose. You know why I know what he's going to choose? Because he chose it already. God relates to reality in a realm that is beyond time where past, present, and future converge into one. So if the future was or the future is present, he knows what I chose, what I will choose as though I have chosen it already. So therefore his knowledge in no way interferes with my free choice. My free choice is completely free, not coerced, not imposed. I'm not playing any script, playing out any script. Ah, he knows. He knows. He knows because, like I know what you chose yesterday today because you did it already. Especially if we want to apply the teachings of Albert Einstein, that time, who revealed that time and space are relative and in different modes of existence, time completely becomes relative. This gives us a little glimpse of understanding that can be a realm where time is completely not relevant and the past and the future and the present converge into a seamless whole. Now, just to sum this up, I quoted in source number one the commentary of the Tiferes Yisra, 
The Teferis Yisrael is a commentary on Mishnayis that was written by Rabbi Yisrael Lipschitz, who was one of the great rabbis and sages in Germany in the 19th century. He passed away in 1861. He was the rabbi of Danzig and, uh, Danzig and other German cities. And he wrote a monumental commentary on Mishnayis, Yochen Oboyes, known as Teferis Yisrael, on the Mishnah in Peri Gimel of Pirkei Avos, chapter 3, Hakel Tzofi Varishus Nesuna, the Teferis Yisrael sums up in lovely language what we have articulated in the previous class and what we have now articulated briefly. Let's see his words. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yedeya Hakel Mashiyei Ase Ba'olam. The Rebbeinu Shalom knows everything that will happen in the world. Nonetheless, everyone has free choice how to live their life. Shaloi Taimar, don't say. Kivan Shakadish Baruch Yadas, Moshe Asa, Yadamaya, Mitzvah, Plainis, Ever, the Plainis, Imkain Mukher Chadam, La Saisa, Vikivan Shakain, and a royal Scharelianish. Since God knew yesterday that the person is going to do today, Sunday morning, you're going to commit this particular mitzvah, for example, he knew you're coming to the Shear this morning. You didn't know, but he knew. Or you're going to commit a particular sin, which of course, present company, excluded. So this means you were compelled to do it. If you're compelled to do it, why should you be rewarded? If you do really have a choice, your choice was delusional. The lesser this is not true, Zakta Tefer Sisra. The Zeh, your shapi, him, how you see the Sakadish Baruchiki, the Isbos of Adam, Shanae, Fellas, Tachas, Asman, over Ivas. This would have been true if God's knowledge was akin to human knowledge, which is subjected to the parameters of past, present, future. Avala Kadish Baruchu, Bora Asman. But the Rebbein Shalom created the reality of time. So when we say God, existed before time, it also means before there was a concept of before, because the very notion of time was created. So all of his knowledge is always, so to speak, in the present. It's always in the present because he's beyond the realm of time. We gave the example, imagine a circle, and you're the center of the circle, and the center of the circle has a uniform relationship to all parts of the circumference. There's no part of the circumference that is closer to the center of the circle than another part. If time is like that circumference of time, present, uh, past, present, and future, we may be on the circle, and what was, was, what is now, is now, what will be, will be. But if you're at the center of that circle, the essence of that reality, all of them you relate to equally, and there Therefore, says the Zveris Yisrael, the Kivan Shekain, Ein Yidiyase Machriya Chesadim B'Maaseyu, his knowledge does not compel man in his action. Ulefichach, Mashaloyim Novin, Eich Sheyi Yidi or B'chiri Yachat, the reason why it's such a difficult concept, why is everybody so perturbed? Why is everybody struggling with the question? How can both Truths exist. God knows and we choose. He says, let me explain to you. We don't really have a conceptual problem with knowledge and choice coexisting. I know what you are doing right now. I see how you're sitting. Does that mean that you don't have a choice to put down your hand? Does that mean that you don't have a choice to stop texting and start listening? Just joking. Of course you have a choice, but I know what you're doing. How do I know? Because I see what you're doing in the present. So there's no problem. Our problem is something else. We don't understand a concept of transcending time. That's our issue. I can't understand how the future is treated like the present. So the Pharisees show says that's a different issue. Therefore he says, He precedes the creation of time. This is the meaning of the words of the Tana in Prekayavis, Rabbi Akiva. Hakol Tsafui. All is foreseen. He did not use a more common term. Hakol Yodua, everything is known. The Bechol Yediya Shayach Avar Vaasit. When you speak of knowledge, I know, I know the past, I speculate the future, I know the present. Knowledge, we know what happened a thousand years ago. We know what happened a hundred years ago. We know about people who existed that we have never seen, we have not even seen a picture, but we know, how do we know? We know from tradition, from history books, whatever the method is. When it comes to tzafui, tzafui means it's seeing. 
as you, though you're observing a phenomenon right now before your eyes. Why does the Tana use that word? Because he's trying to answer the contradiction. Hakol Tsofoy, it's seeing right now. If it's seeing right now, why not Arashus Nesuna? So why don't you have permission to choose your path? So a very, very beautiful, beautiful diuk. This diuk is already in Medrash Mu. Avol mila tsofoy hanu shiroya hadove ko'evo lofonam. Vezeo kavona sarambam peirik hei mitshuva. I think in the original device it says Perik uh, Perik Vav, but it's Perik Hey, I believe. Perik Hey Mitshuva. I, I, I corrected it when I copied it without looking it up. I think it's Perik Hey. Perik Hey Mitshuva Bikra. Loi Mach Shavoy Se Mach Shavoy Sech. The Rambam in Hilchis Shuva asks the question, as we quoted last year, how can God know when we have free choice? And the Rambam maintains with absolute certainty, and I should say ferociousness, that every human being is free to make their own choices of how to live. And the Rambam says this is Iker Godel, it's the fundamental maxim of Yiddishkeit. Without this, the whole concept of Torah and Mitzvahs, this integrates the whole concept of human accountability, ceases to exist. But if God knows everything, how does that work? And the Rambam then goes on to give a long answer. And the, co- the crux of his answer is, God's knowledge is not like our knowledge, and therefore we don't understand how he knows things. So the Ravid criticizes of the Rambam and he says, don't start a question and then tell people you can't understand. So don't ask. You trigger my curiosity and then you tell me you can't understand. He says, better leave it for the Tmimim. What do you have to make questions? Some people don't ask these questions. So at least let them not be bothered. Don't ask this Rambam's question. He's very upset at the Rambam. The the Pharisee Israel says, no. What the Rambam meant was, what the Rambam means is not that we can't understand Yidiyu Abkhiri. He's giving a good answer. The Ravid's question is removed. The Rambam is giving a good answer. He's explaining that knowledge beforehand does not contradict free choice. The reason he keeps on saying we can't understand is what he means is we don't understand what it means to know the future as though it was the present. This is how the Teferis Yisrael and others, Reb Moshe Mashinino, much before him, Tferes is always the 19th century, of Marshal Mashalim, as I said, is the 16th century, understood, the Tferes Yomtev understood the words of the Ramb. Now, is that really Pshat in the Rambam? I mean, yes, according to many it is. But we'll see, Savait from Parshat. When you learn the Rambam, it's a little difficult to assume that this is what the Rambam meant, but we'll get to that soon. Somebody raised that question last year. Let's still focus on this explanation of Yediyah and Bechira, which has been uh, developed and maintained and protected and explained probably by most of the Mepharshim, by most of the commentators, the Jewish philosophers, the thinkers, from as far as early as Reb Sa'ad Yagon, Reb Sa'ad Yagon in the 900s, who says this explanation, even though he's usually not quoted, although he's the first source for this explanation in Amunas Vedeus, in his philosophical book. This is the, the earliest, or one of the earliest Jewish works on philosophy by Reb Sa'ad Yagon, Amunas Vedeus, all the way down to our generation, whether it's Dar Sameach or... Uh, there's a Sefer Shiure Das by uh, Rabbi Yosef Lei Bloch, the famous Rav and Rosh Hashivah of Tells, analyzes this and dissects it and brings proofs and explains it at length and many other contemporary and ancient svarim throughout all the generations and the most common is the Tois Vesyamtif which is on the side of most editions of the Mishnaya Samprikayavas. At first glance, this seems like a com- realm that relates to the world of Jewish philosophy. What we call Hashkofa, theology, Chira, Chira, philosophy, to try to reconcile God's knowledge with our choices. The Rambam brings it up in his Sefer of Halacha, Mishnah Tayyib, we are in Hilchis Tshuva, where he explains the idea that you are accountable for your actions, and therefore there is a need for tshuva, which is repentance. So for that, the Rambam has to explain the concept of Chira, which is free choice. <laughs> a 
And here, parenthetically, we encounter a fascinating insight that we could learn from where the Rambam placed this discussion. The Rambam has four, his halachic work, Yad HaChazok, has 14 svarim. Mada, Av, Zmanim, Noshim, Kedusha, Afla, Zroim, Avoide, Karbonis, Tyre, Nezik, and Kenyam, Mishpatim, Shoftim. I won't translate right now, but you could look it up. 14 works. The first one is called Mada. What's Mada? Mada is, as the Rambam says, the basics of what the Jewish perspective on life is. His first section is Hilchis Yisoyde HaTayra, the fundamentals of Torah. What does he discuss there? The existence of God. Love of God. Reverence of God. Torah Min HaShamayim. Prophecy. Matan Torah. Kiddush Hashem. That's Hilchis Yisoyde HaTayra. The Rambam then has Hilchis Deyes, the laws of ethics. That's where he discusses relationships between people, love between people, uh, the laws of gossip, slander, key, maintaining your health, marriage, etc. Uh, the ethics of marriage, not the laws of marriage. The Rambam has Hilchis Talmud Torah, Hilchis Avoid Zorah, and finally Hilchis Truva, the laws of repentance. These are the Yisoy, the Atayra, the basics of Jewish Hashkafa, as far as Mada, knowledge, perspective. Then is Ava, love. Davening, benching, Krishma, Tfilin, Mezuzah, Sevatari, then Isman and Pimes, Shabbos, Yom Tif, Pesach, Sukkot, etc. Kedusha, Hafla, very structured the Rambam. Where would you expect him to place his three chapters that he dedicates to free choice, Pchira? You would expect it in Hilchis Yisoydi HaTayra, in the fundamentals of Taira, the same place where he discusses there's prophecy. Moshe Rabbeinu was God's prophet. There is a concept of Nevuah, Taira is Manashamayim, Matan Taira is a reality. He proves logically why Jews accepted Matan Taira. It's not a faith that's blind or super rational. The Rambam's famous historical explanation for the validity of Matan Taira, the idea of God, you would think, he says in Hilchis Tshuva, that Pchir is Amud HaTayra V'Amitzvah, it's the pillar of Taira Mitzvah. Why isn't it in the basics of Torah, you said, yeah, Torah. why is it in Hilchis Tshuva? True, if there's no Bechira, there's no Tshuva, <laughs> if I don't have a choice, if everything is predetermined, if it's my mother's fault, or my grandmother's fault, or the serpent's fault, or Chava's fault, right, so then there's no point in Tshuva, true, but every mitzvah is that way, Hilchis Tfilin. can God tell you to put on Tfilin if you don't have Bechira, what's the difference? If it's all predetermined, there's no point in telling you what to do. You're anyway living out a script if there's no Bechira. So every mitzvah is dependent on Bechira. The same is with Sukkah, the same is with Shoifer, the same is the, the prohibition of speaking gossip. Every mitzvah, why does the Rambam choose to put it in Hilchus Tshuva? The answer to this is very, is very, it's simple but it's profound. Because Bechira, the relationship between Bechira and every other mitzvah is in the Gavra, it's not in the Heftzah. The relationship between Bechira and Tshuva is in the Hefts as well. Let me explain to you what I mean. What's the definition of blowing the mitzvah, blowing Shoifer on Rosh Hashanah? The definition is taking a ram's horn and blowing Shoifer on Rosh Hashanah. As the Gemara says, Rachmana Omar Tiku. Blow or listen. Lishmaya kal Shoifer. That's the mitzvah. Listen to the kal Shoifer. What's the definition of sukkah? That for seven days you should have a sukkah and you should eat in the sukkah and live in the sukkah, sleep, walk around, dwell in the sukkah. Teish vukeit aduri. That's the definition. Of course, if there's no pchira, the mitzvah is pointless because I can't command you something if I don't expect that you have the choice to do it. If you're forced, if you're in shackles, the mitzvah becomes pointless. But it's not that the definition of the mitzvah ceases to exist if there's no bechira. Let's say you're forced. The reason you heard Shoifra and Rishashana was purely genetic influence. Nur nature or nurture. You happen to end up living in Muncie in a religious community. You happen to grow up not only in an orthodox home, but an ultra-orthodox home, completely beyond your choice. You happen to end up in this place, and therefore you happen to hear Shoifra and Rishashana. But the definition of Shefer and Rosh Hashanah still exists, even if you were forced. Somebody forces you to put on tefillin. Somebody forces you to light Hanukkah candles. You still lit Hanukkah candles. The heftah of the mitzvah is a heftah, even if there's no Bechira. It's just without Bechira, there's no point in telling you to do it, nor is there a reason to reward a person for any action. When it comes to tshuva, it's very different. With tshuva, if you take out the idea of Bechira, the hefts of tshuva doesn't exist. What's the definition of tshuva? What's the definition of tshuva, I ask you? Debe, what's the definition of tshuva? What's the definition of tshuva? 
Definition of tshuva is not I get up and I say Hashem no begad no kazam. Definition of tshuva is what? Remorse. I regret something I did and I make a resolve that in the future I will not do it. I ask you a question. If I have no bechira, can I have genuine remorse? Can I have genuine resolve for the future? The very definition of tshuva completely disintegrates if you don't believe in free choice. So where does the Rambam choose to put Bechira in Hilchas Shuvah, not in any other halacha, because that's the very hefts of Shuvah, the idea that I am accountable. <laughs> I could have done better in the past, and therefore I'm capable of doing something different in the future. That is the, that, so it's not only the Gavra which necessitates Bechira, it's the very hefts. And yet at first glance it seems that even though this is a prerequisite for Yiddishkeit, it's still a question of philosophy. How do we reconcile it with genetics? How do we reconcile it with the neurological developments of recent years? How do we reconcile it with God's knowledge, etc.? But what I want to show you today is how this very discussion and the question and the answer that we explain from the Teferis Yisrael and the other philosophers of Mepharshim expresses itself and occupies a very interesting space in the world of halacha, in the world of Jewish law. And this has been articulated by two of the greatest geniuses and teachers and go'inim of last generation, Rabbi Yosef Engel and Rabbi Yosef Rosen. Rosen. Rabbi Yosef Engel and the Rogachov Gon, Rabbi Yosef Rosen. Rabbi Yosef Engel and the Rakachover were both born in the same year, 1858. Rabbi Yosef Engel in Poland, the Rakachover in Rakachov, which is a city in Belarus. Rabbi Yosef Engel went to become the rabbi of Krakow and passed away, I believe, in 1920. 1920 and authored some very famous works, although many of his writings are not around. His daughter, he had one daughter who was married to a Morgenstern, a grandson of the Kotzke Rebbe, who published some of his writings, La Kachtoiv, Beis HaOitzer, Shivim Panam Lutair, Asvin Der some other great works. And his contemporary was the Rav Gon, who became the Rav of Dvinsk, which is today in Latvia, sheared a pulpit in the city of the Meir Simcha Akayin, who was the Rav of the Ashkenazim, and the Rakachava was the Rav of the Hasidim in Dvinsk, and the Rakachava passed away 16 years after Rabbi Yosef Engel, Tainus Esther, 1936. Both of them, and I believe not knowing of what the other person wrote, in the same generation, took this very dilemma and brought it, showed how a major element in halacha, in practical halacha, is based on it. Now, it gets a little complex and a little abstract. But Be'ezer Hashem will try to explain it to the best of our ability so we can comprehend what Rabbi Yosef Engel and Yerach Chavagon are saying. The issue we're going to be discussing is known in Shas as Shnei Dvorim Haboyim Kiyachot. Meaning... Two things that are not really happening simultaneously. One is the result of another. And yet in halacha, we treat them as though they have occurred simultaneously with very dramatic effects in Jewish law, as we will see in a moment. We know there's a concept called Sibba and Mesuvav. The Rambam and almost any philosopher uses this term constantly. Sibba means a cause and Mesuvav means the if an effect. Naturally, according to logic, we would assume that the Siba must precede the Mesuvah. For example, it's very difficult to entertain the idea that you should be older than your father or your mother. Why? Because your mother is your Siba and you are the Mesuvah. And the cause precedes the effect. Right? So I can't be older than my mother because I come from my mother, after my mother, subsequently to my mother. Obviously. That's chronologically. But you also have Sibo Mufsuvov in concept. For example, for example, the Rambam says this in a safe from Milis Ahigoyan, we will soon see. Right. One plus, I'll give on my own example. One, we'll soon see the Rambam's example. One plus one equals two. Right? I think, Clark, yeah? Two minus one, 
<laughs> equals one. Which one preceded which? <laughs> Both exist simultaneously, right? But which one preceded which in logic? So we all understand that only because one plus one equals two, so now we know that two is a combination of two ones, therefore if you take one off two, so then you'll end up with one. So you have Siba and Mesuvah, the cause and the effect of the cause. In halacha, however, it gets complicated because what happens in a situation when the Siba causes the Mesuvah, you would think that the Mesuvah is a result of the Siba. And here is where we find an astonishing counter idea in halacha. And let me introduce it through a famous and quite wonderful hakira of the Minchas Chinuch. It's in your sources, your second source, Minchas Chinuch, in Mitzvah's essay Dal. Now the Minchas Chinuch, you probably know, was authored by Rabbi Yosef Bavad, who wrote a commentary on the Sefer HaChinuch, which is an encyclopedia of all of the 600 mitzvahs of Torah. And the Minchas Chinuch is his great monumental commentary on Sefer HaChinuch. He passed away in 1874 and was one of the greatest rabbis in Galicia in the 19th century, known for his book Minchas Chinuch. The Minchas Chinuch poses the following question, and listen carefully. Two witnesses... Come, let me, let, me, let me give you an intro. Two witnesses come to Besden. They tell Besden, we have seen the new moon last night. What was last night? Last night would have been the night following the 29th day of Adar. And we have seen the new moon of the new month. And therefore, Besden naturally would investigate them. And if Besden determines that they are Honest witnesses, Bezdin is Mekadosh the Chaydesh, and this day is declared as the first day of Nisan, Aleph Nisan. Based on the testimony of these two witnesses of Kiddush HaChaydesh, and all seems to be wonderful. So this month does not have 30 days, this month only has 29 days. Why? Because the two witnesses came and testified that what you would have thought was the 30th day of the month is really the first day of the next month. After Bezdin made this day Rish Chodesh, two other witnesses come to Bezdin and they say, these guys, Yankel and Shmeru, <laughs> we spent the entire weekend with them in Miami. Well, that would have been hard in the time of Bezdin. But we spent the entire weekend with them in Tveria and Tiberias. We were with them all night. We're not going to tell you what they did throughout the night, but we're going to tell you that they were not watching the moon. This is a classical case of Hazama. Two other witnesses come and say, You were with us the entire night, which means by definition your testimony was false because the people were not even there. And therefore, according to Allah, Bezdin would accept the testimony of the second pair of witnesses after scrutiny and disqualify the testimony of the first ones. And as a result of that... Rosh Chodesh is cancelled, and therefore the day, the month has 30 days, and Rosh Chodesh is only the next day. Okay, good. Says the Menchus here's the issue. These two, the second two witnesses who came, yeah. their bar mitzvah is on Rosh Chodesh Nissen. Their bar mitzvah is on Rosh Chodesh Nissen. K'tanim apostolates. Minors are not accepted as witnesses. For them to be witnesses, <laughs> this day has to be Rishchidishness. So the first two witnesses came and said, we saw the moon, so Bezdin made this day Rishchidishness. Now the next two witnesses come, it's Rishchidishness, and wait, Bar Mitzvah, great! We could be witnesses. They come and they say, these guys were with us all night. Ben is okay, it's not Rosh Chodesh. So it's not Rosh Chodesh, so what's today? Today is the 30th day of Adar. If it's the 30th day of Adar, they're not Bar Mitzvah yet. So they're not accepted as witnesses. So they're not accepted as witnesses. So the two first witnesses are good witnesses. So therefore it's Rosh Chodesh Nissen. So if it's Rosh Chodesh Nissen, now they are good witnesses. So it's not Rosh Chodesh Nissen. So if it's not Rosh Chodesh Nissen, so they're not good witnesses. So it is Rosh Chodesh Nissen. You get the problem? <laughs> The Minchas Chinuch. Take a look inside. Ah, 
Extraordinary, fascinating Chikida by the Minchas Chinuch. Mitzvah says, say, Dalit, second paragraph. Oid, on the Yis Tapik, Ibiyoyim, Lamet Shalad, or Bo'oedim, Shem Shad, Oas, HaChadish, De'el, Katshri, Ayoyim, O Bo'oedim, Shanel, Du, Koydim, Mit, Gimbal, Shana, Berish, Chodish, V'yata, Berish, Chodish, Nisin, Nasu, G'doylem, Mizim, Mesedim, K'shedim, Oish, Poislin, Oish, and Beza, Veda, Shad, O, Ayoyim, Shosu, Oish, and Medim, K'shedim, Eich, Lodim, Boza. These two guys whose birthdays were Chodish, Nisin, come and they say the Edis were with us, or maybe something else, they saw that the Edis committed a sin which disqualifies them as kosher witnesses. What should the court do? What's the question? Im ye kabelu abeis din as edim akshirim etamze kivan deke edim she poislin oisam hayoy meid adir v'loy nissin v'loy naslu a poislin gdoylim. If you accept them, it's not nissin, so they're minors. Uktanim edim yichelim lifsel edim. Two children cannot disqualify kosher witnesses. Vim kain oivrim ala mitzvah she yesh bekan ata edim kshirim vein mekabelu oisam. So what will bezdin do? They have two edis who are kosher and they're not accepting them. Vim ye kabelu abezdin v'yikatshu achay. If they make it rich so retroactively, these guys are adults. So now it's a wrong rich chodesh. How can Bezdin accept them knowing that they are possible? It's true, but the Yevid, it says, You want initially, they should accept two people who are possible. If they not mekadesh, so the mezim and aktanim, and therefore they're kosher, so you have to make it rishchodesh. Here we have an example of this, what we call paradox. You have a siba, you have a mesuva, you have a cause, you have a result, meaning, you accept these edis, it becomes rishchodesh. As a result of that, what's the mesuvah? As a result of that, they're adults. Because it's Rishchaydash. If they're adults, so now you accept them, it becomes Ais Rishchaydash. Here you have an issue. Now, once we understood this question of the Minchas Chinuch, Let's see how this is reflected, not only in the theoretical question that the Minchas Chinuch poses to get us thinking, but how it expresses itself practically in every situation. Let's learn our Shtikol Gemara, Gitin Daf Ayin Zayin Amid Beis. The Gemara needs a little intro, although I'm sure many of you remember this Gemara from the Yeshiva days or from recent learning. We all know the Parshish Kiseitze tells us that for a divorce to happen halachically, the Kosav law say for Krisis, the Nosan be Yodo. The man must prepare right a get a document of divorce and give it to the woman in her hand. Once she receives it in her Yodo, then she is legally divorced. He is not married, she is not married, life moves on. Explain Chazal in Mesech Tegitin that Venosan Biyoda requires that it becomes completely hers. It's in her hand, it's in her domain, it's in her property. If he still maintains some sheer ownership over the get, for example, he gives her the get with a string and he could still pull it away even though she's holding it, it's an invalid get. It has to be completely hers. We know there's a mission in Gittin on that page that if he puts it in her chatzer, she owns a home. And he places the get in her chatzer, there's something called Kenyan chatzer. It's like an extension of her hand, of her body. It's her property, it's her home. So this is as though she received it, and therefore at that moment, she is divorced. Of course, if she takes it in her hand, she's also divorced. That's the primary posseg, the Nasan Biyadi puts it in her hand. The Chiddush is, he could put it even into the Chatz. Now here is the issue. We know that if the wife and the husband agree, there's a very known halacha, known as Nichse Maluk. If a woman brings property, real estate, merchandise, assets into a marriage, 
The Chachamim instituted that in lieu of the husband taking full responsibility, like in the good old days, to support all of the needs of his wife, so she need worry about nothing in terms of finance. In lieu of that, there's an exchange. The exchange is that if she happens to make money, he has the right to take it, to use it. Because he is supporting all the needs of the household, including her. If she says, I don't want that deal, I'll work myself, I make my own money, I'll take care of myself, no problem. The Gemara says there, that's a halachic right, she can decide, if dafnish deine toivis, if dafnish deine toivis, I'll take care of myself, my money, my atzma, my money that I generate goes to myself. But if it's a situation where he's taking full responsibility for all of her needs, whether it's medical, financial, etc., etc., then the halach is, my seyadel l'bayl. Tiknu mezoymes, she gets everything, but my seyadev, she makes and she brings in assets, it's l'bayl. What does it mean it's l'bayl? She brings in a house to the marriage. The house doesn't automatically go over to him. The pshat is that as long as they're married, he uses the paris, meaning if the house is generating rent, what's called the produce, the, the benefits, the paris, the fruits, that belongs to him. What happens if they get divorced? Chas v'shalom? Then, of course, the property goes completely to her, and he gets nothing because it was her asset that she brought into the marriage. Here is the paradox. If he puts the get in her chatzer, right? In her chatzer, it's hers, but they're married. So who owns the chatzer? According to the institution of marriage, who owns the chatzer? He owns the chatzer, Right? He owns the chatzah. What it means he owns the chatzah is not that he will forever own the chatzah. It means that as long as they're married, he has ownership of the chatzah. When they get divorced, it'll become hers. For her to gain independent ownership of the chatzah, what has to happen? She has to be divorced. For her to be divorced, <laughs> the get has to be in her chatzah. But she's not divorced yet. So again, can this get work halachically? We have a problem here. Because for the get to work, it has to be her chatzah. But for it to be her chatzah, the get has to work. But the get can't work if it's not her chatzah, because you're not putting it in her domain. It's still shared with you. So this is the problem. This is what the Gemara addresses. Zog the Gemara, Rav Amar, Atu Yodami, like, Kanye Leilabal. Forget her chatzah. You place it in her hand. You have the same problem. What a woman acquires according to the halachic institution of marriage. Again, this is not if they make a stipulation that she wants to be independent and not be supported by him. But if not, what she is koina goes automatically to him. So now when you give her a get and she's not divorced yet, what happens? It's his get. So for her to own her own hands and acquire her own things, she has to be divorced. But for her to be divorced, it has to be her own yet. So you have here the same problem. Ella says, Rave, Gito v'yoda boyin ke'echot. The two things happen simultaneously. Hachanami, Gito v'chatzeiru boyin ke'echot. The same is true, it happens simultaneously. What does it mean it happens simultaneously? She acquires the chatzir and she gets divorced simultaneously. <laughs> so I put the get, you put the get into her chatzir. She's not divorced yet because the chatzir is not hers. For the chatzah to be hers, she has to be divorced. So which one happens first? What's the siba? What's the mesuvah? You would think the siba is, she has to get divorced. As a result of divorce, the chatzah becomes hers, right? But she can't get divorced if the chatzah is not hers. So now the result has to precede the cause. A result can't precede a cause. So Rav says, you're right. It happens together, simultaneously. What does it mean it happens simultaneously? I give the get in the chatzah, she gets divorced at that very moment as she acquires the chatzah so she can get divorced. He doesn't explain how that works. So the Gemara continues, Amalei Ravina Ravashi. Rave Yadi Isha Kakashila, he really had this question. A man owns his wife's hands? Listen, man. You think you own your wife's hands? Who ever said that? You don't own her yacht. You give her a get, of course it's hers. She can't take anything. It means, 
If she generates money with her hands, it's a financial agreement. You don't own your wife's body. Of course, if you give her a get, it's hers. What's the question? You don't even have a problem here. You don't need to get to make her own her own hands and therefore take what she wants to take and it's hers. I'm sorry, I'm She said, Rave Yad Ha'evet Kakashile. You're mixing up. Rava was perturbed by another situation. Here's the situation. You own a slave, an Evet Knaini. One of the ways to create emancipation for this non-Jewish Canaanite slave is you give him a star shikhru. You give him a document which articulates that he's a free man and now he's free and he becomes a full-fledged Jew. Prior to that, he's in a limbo state as far as a Jew. He's an Evid Kanaini, meaning he's a Canaanite Evid, a non-Jewish Evid who's now owned by a Jew. And as a result of that, he has to have a bris and he's mechuyiv in some of the mitzvahs, but not in all of the mitzvahs. Once you liberate him, he becomes a full-fledged Jew. How do you liberate him? You give him a star shikhr. One second. Yad evet ki yad rabbi. Masha kona evet kona rabbi. What the servant acquires, the master acquires. The moment you give him a document, who acquired it? You acquired it. So if it's in your hand, he's not free anymore. So how does this work? The answer is, The answer is, Meaning, the document... The document, the document that says he's free and his yad, his independence, happens simultaneously. So by giving him this document, he becomes a free person. But the only way he could be a free person is if he receives it as an individual, which for that he has to be free. So it happens simultaneously. And the same is true with Gita Vachatzer. In English, we have a term for it. What's the term? Catch-22 situation, right? Catch-22 is a slogan that was coined, I think, from some novel that somebody wrote about people who were trying to get out from service during the Second World War, and they claim that they're dealing with insanity. So by saying that they're insane, you had to let them off. But of course, if they have enough seichel to tell you that they're insane, they're not insane. So as a result of you letting them off because they're insane, you have to put them back into service. So this coined the phrase, a catch-22 situation. But as we see here, it precedes a most recent novel from, I think, the Second World War, if I'm not mistaken, by thousands of years. His get and his hand, his individual independence to be kind of something, happen simultaneously. What's the mechanism of this? How does this work? This, the Gemara doesn't say. This, Ravid just says, this is how it is, and this is how it's accepted. Let's see now another situation, a very different halach. Next source, Sanhedrin, Daftazayin, Amit Beis. Zog de Hele ki Gemara. Kol ha-kelim sha-asa Moshe, Meshichasun mekachon. Mekan ve-helech, Avedasun mechanachson. All of the kelim, all of the utensils in the Mishkan that Moshe created... What made them holy? What do we mean? Every keli, every vessel used in the Beis HaMikdash was kadosh, it was holy. For example, a bowl, a cup. And why is it so important that it was holy? Because when you put flour into that bowl that was holy, that is what created the chalois hakdusha. It's what conferred sanctity on the flower, that this flower could now be burnt on the Mizbeach as an offering to Hashem. This was the mechanism of the Avaidah. So the vessels were holy, and when the blood, for example, was placed in the clay shahris in the vessel, the blood is now sanctified with the holiness of the vessel, and now you could take this blood and sprinkle it on the altar as a result of which the sacrifice accomplished whatever its goal and achievement was as a sin offering or a thanks offering or a, tum- or a carbon sib or whatever the carbon may be. Zag de Gemara. What made the vessels holy? The vessels were holy because Moshe anointed all of the vessels with an oil. Shemana Mishcha discussed in Parshas Tetzav. Mikan 
What about newer vessels? Vessels broke. They had to replace them. They had to make new ones. They got old. The Mishkan was around for hundreds of years. So you didn't anoint them with Moshe's oil because the Pasuk says clearly only the original ones. So what made the vessels holy? What brought chinuch means when you initiate a process like education. What made them holy? The actual avoid. Meaning, when I take a bowl and I use it for the avoid, for example, I use it to accept the blood of an animal, which I'm going to sprinkle, doing the avoid with that keli, that makes the keli holy. Says Rabbi Yosef Engel in his Sefer Beis HaOitzer. Under letter Beis, where he discusses Bayin Kiyachad, he says, one second, how does this work? For the blood to become holy, the vessel has to be holy. But the only way the vessel is becoming holy is how? Through doing the Avoidah with it. What does it mean doing the Avoidah with it? That you have blood that becomes holy as a result of this vessel. But when you put in the blood, the vessel is not holy to make the blood holy yet. <laughs> right? For the vessel to become holy, you need to do the avoid with it. But to do the avoid with it, the vessel has to be holy. So the Rabbi Yosef Engel says, here you have an example of the same principle we learned by Git and Boy and Kiachat. The cause and the result happen again simultaneously. And he brings another few Gemaras and Rishonim him on the same Mahalach, which I'm not going to quote, you can look it up. Bringing out a similar point of buying kiyachar and these halachas of karbanas in the Mishkan and the Beis Hamikdash. What's the mechanism? Is there an explanation? Is it exeris hakasuf? So all acharonim discuss. I mean, all many acharonim. There's a famous ktsois achoshen. There's a famous achiyas by Reb Chaim Moiser. There's a famous Avni Nezer. I never know. So a lot of svarim discuss this. But Rabbi Yosef Engel and the Rakachava God have a unique way of dealing with this. The Ktsai Sachoshin in Simon Reish poses the following question. Let's say I want to give you my house as a gift. How do I give you my house as a gift legally? So there are different mechanisms. One of them is a star. I can't just verbally say the house is yours. That doesn't mean anything. I could regret it. You could regret it. One of the mechanisms is a star, a document. So I tell this person, here's the deal. This home is yours, and the document of the gift is inside the house. Are you going to say here the rule of Bayim Kiechat? <laughs> For you to acquire the house, you need to acquire the document. But the only way you can acquire the document is if you acquire the house. But you can only acquire the house through the document. Once it's your house, now the document is yours, because Kenyan Chatzar, whatever goes into your house is yours, but it's not your house yet. The Ketzai Sachosha says, you're never going to say this. By get, you say it. Why do you say it by get? For her to acquire the get, it has to be her Chatzar. But the only way it's going to become her Chatzar is if she acquires the document. By sales and gifts, you won't say it. By get, and you will say it. This is the great dilemma of the Ketzai Sachosha. What happened? The reason you won't say it by a sale, because it doesn't make sense. Think about it practically. I give you my car, I give you my house, and I say the document is inside. Fine, go get the document. But if you don't get the document, how could you be it? There's no legal mechanism here. Once it's your house, it'll become your document. But for it to become your house, you need to acquire the document. How does the woman get divorced? How does the slave go free? So let's see how these two sages dealt with this question. So we're now going to learn a shtickle Rabbi Yosef Engel. Okay. You still with us? Or you have any Adalias and Hashama? Okay. Rabbi Yosef Engel, Beis Ha'itzer, Klolim, Oiz Beis, Boyen Kiechot. I mean, it's a unique, a unique stickle. Unique. If you follow with, it's going to take a few minutes, but you'll get it. Be'ezer Hashem. If you see, Be'chizkuni ala Torah Shema is parashach of Tes Pasek Yudalit. Ve'ez p'sara par tishrev be'eish minchutz lamach nechatas hu. There's a Pasek in parashach that's have a perich of Tes. What Aaron and his children are supposed to do for seven days when they put up the Mishkan. And on the eighth day. 
And the answer is every day they had to bring a par, an ox as a carbon chapas, a ram as a carbon oila, and another ram as a carbon shlomith. Now, the law by a traditional carbon chatos that was offered on the regular mizbeach, you would slaughter it, you would sprinkle the blood on the mizbeach, part of it was burnt on the altar, and part of it was eaten by the kayanim. This is the law by all carbon chatoyas that were offered on the outer altar, versus chatoyas that were offered on the inner altar, they had a different status, there you had to burn the meat outside, but this is an ox that's being burnt on the outer altar as a carbon chatos, together with a ram as a carbon oil, which is not eaten, together with another ram as a carbon shlum, in which part of it is eaten by the kayanim. But here it says, this ox for eight days you have to burn in fire, meaning you have to take all the meat, besides the few pieces that are burnt on the altar, all the meat that would usually be eaten has to be burnt mechutz lamachana. Says the Chizkuni Vezel Hashayna. V'yesh nois nintam. Rashi says there, Loi matzonu chatos chitzoyna nishrefes ele bezu. Nowhere in Jewish law is there another precedent of a carbon chatos being completely burnt, not on the altar, outside of the camp, only by this one brought when they dedicated the Mishka. V'yesh nois nintam. Loma nishrefu chatos hamiluyim. V'chatos shmini limiluyim. Why? Why? Why is this chatas different? Why is it the only one that's excluded from the law of any other sin offering in the whole Torah? So one reason is perhaps He suggests this came from the Kayan himself. It's not usually the Kayan is bringing it for somebody else. And the Mincha that the Kayan used to bring every day was completely burnt on the Mizbeach, which is of course problematic because here it wasn't burnt on the Mizbeach, it was burnt outside. Okay. Tam Acher Lamas and Nisraf, Commission of Foresh, a cost of Hatos he, Nisinus Tam Lama Nisraf. Skuni says, Take a look in the Torah. The words are Tisrev Beish, Mechutzla Machana, Hatos he. You know why you should burn it? Because it's a Hatos. Doesn't that strengthen the question? If it's a Hatos, you shouldn't burn it. He says, Hatos he answers it. Why? Zakte Hiskuni. The Pasuk says the reason they brought this ox every day is to make the altar holy so that all the offerings could be brought on the Mizbech. As a result of this ox, the Pasuk says, you cleaned out, you cleansed, you purified the Mizbech. When you put the blood of this ox on it, you made the Mizbech a holy piece of furniture on which carbonus could be burnt and blood sprinkled. And when did the cleansing become complete? Only when you place the blood on the Mizbeach. So when you shecht it, the axe, it's like you didn't shecht it by the Mizbeach. It would be like a halacha. Let's say you shecht a carbon based on Mikdash and the Mizbeach is blemished. It's not a kosher Mizbeach. What's the halacha? It's not a good carbon. It's possible now you want to eat the carbon. You can't eat such a carbon. It's not a good carbon. Just like there's different dinim that passel a carbon. If there's no Mizbeach, if it's a damaged Mizbeach, you can't, you can't, you, you, if it's a damaged Mizbeach, it's possible. It's like you took the meat and you took it out of the place. Out of the place, you take meat out of Yerushalayim. You take meat out of the base. Some meat, it depends what type of carbon. You can't eat it. These are the words of the Chizkuni explaining why this chatos could not be eaten. The blood was sprinkled. The fat was burnt. The Mizbeach became holy. But the Kayan couldn't eat it. So what do you do with it? You burn it. This is the Chizkuni. Asks the Beis HaOitz Rabbi Yosef Engel, he says, one second, I don't understand this. I really don't understand this. I can't eat it. Why? Because it's a puzzle of carbon. Why is it a puzzle of carbon? Because when I shechted it, there was no mezbeach. Because <laughs> I shechted it, then I take the blood, then I burn the fat, then I sprinkle the blood. When I sprinkle the blood, then the mezbeach becomes holy. Right? When I shechted it, there was no mezbeach. So therefore it's a puzzle of carbon, I can't eat it. So ask Rabbi Yosef Engel, so how are you allowed to burn its fat on the Mizbeach? How are you allowed to sprinkle its blood on the Mizbeach? I don't understand. It's a puzzle of carbon. Let's say you're a Kayan and you puzzle a carbon. 
Any way you parcel it, your thoughts, whatever you do to parcel a carbon, you take the carbon and you do something that makes it disqualified. You're allowed to sprinkle its blood. You're allowed to burn its fat on the Mizbeach. It's not a kosher carbon. Of course, you're not allowed to eat it either. So how are you allowed to do these things? Asks Rabbi Yosef Engel. It's a carbon plus. Elama, you're going to answer. Bayim kechot. It happens simultaneous. What do we mean it happens simultaneous? When you shecht the carbon, and through this process you're going to sanctify the Mizbeach, so it happens simultaneously. It's true. For the carbon to be kosher, the Mizbeach has to be sanctified. For the Mizbeach to be sanctified, for the Mizbeach to be sanctified, you have to sprinkle the blood in a kosher way of a kosher carbon. But it's not a kosher carbon of the Mizbeach. It's not sanctified. But for the Mizbeach to be sanctified, you need a good blood. You need a kosher carbon. But that only happens through the Mizbeach. Boyim kiyachot. It happens simultaneously. If you're saying that... And therefore it's a kosher carbon, so why can't you eat it? You can't say the Chizkuni doesn't agree with it. Because if he would agree with this, don't sprinkle the blood. And don't burn the fat, if it's really possible. It's not really possible. Why? Because we're applying Bayim Kiyachat. Just like we did with the Kalim in Mesech the Sanhedrin. So why can't you eat the carbon? You understand his question? This is the Beis Haitz's question. And here, we encounter an astounding answer. And suddenly, you DM Pira, knowledge and free choice, come out right here in Halacha. Take a look at the words of the Beis Heitzer. It's a shtickle. He employs a lot of philosophical terms. But I think after our introductions, it will be pretty clear. Turn the second side of your first source sheet, page 2. V'ulam. V'ulam. It's page 2 and then page 3. V'ulam, you see? We're going to read now a shtickle Rabbi Yosef Engel inside and I'm going to translate. In order not to completely turn this chizkuni into something incomprehensible, I'm going to suggest this, says Rabbi Yosef Engel. The BMS, the reason the carbon chatas is kosher is because of the principle of boyin kiyach. To who atz my kiddush am isbeach, why they shayim isbeach, hayim a mela chatas kosher. He made the Mizbeach holy, and as a result of the Mizbeach being holy, that made the carbon kosher, and they happened together. I, it's a cause and a result. Sibo Mesuvav, we established that Halach acknowledges two things happening together. But when am I going to say Boyim Kiyachad only to make the carbon kosher relative to those things that I'm doing with the altar? Can I sprinkle the blood? Yeah. Can I burn the fat on the Mizbeach? No problem. Why? It's a great carbon. How did it become a great carbon? Because it's a holy Mizbeach. How did it become a holy Mizbeach? Because it's a good carbon. But when it comes to eating, here it won't work. Why not? Why not? It's a good carbon or not a good carbon? Kosher Apostle. You have a mamish paradox. For one issue, it's a perfect carbon. For another issue, it's, an imp- it's a flawed carbon. How does this work? <laughs> And here, Rabbi Yosef Engel is forced to take this discussion to completely another level. I shouldn't say forced. Rabbi Yosef Engel believes that now you have to go to a different level. When you have two things, and each one is the cause for something else. Meaning, how, how does this Mizbeach become holy? Because this chatas is kosher, and doing the avoid with a real carbon is making the mizbeach holy. And yet, what makes this chatas kosher? That you have a valid mizbeach. Because without a mizbeach, you shecht it, it's possible. Valkain, Leo is based varim kaela. Next page three. When you have two things, one is the cause for the other. 
One is the cause for two, and two is the cause for one. So you can't have two without one, but you can't have one without two. So what do you do? I need one to get two. But in order, in order to get one, I, have to, I need two. But I can't get to two without one, and one needs two. So it's an impossibility. Logically, you're stuck. I need a carbon to make it holy. I need the Mizbeach holy, right? Which is two, to have one, to make it a carbon. You can't have a carbon without a Mizbeach. Hine yesh kushi this is a problem in comprehension. It's a problem to comprehend. The cause precedes the result. It's as powerful as time. Just like you can't be older than your mother, the result can't precede the cause, even if chronologically it's the same time. The Rambam has a say from Milo Sahigoyim where he discusses basics of logic, and there he says this. So number two must follow number one. So how can now number two? Become number one, preceding number two, when the whole number two is based on number one. So again, you can't have two without one, so you first need one. But you can't have one without two, so two follows one. How can it precede it? You don't have the mechanism. How can the later, what follows, become the father, the mother? How could you be older than your Zayd? It doesn't work that way. For you to exist, you need your mother. Imagine if for your mother to exist, they would need you. Doesn't work that way. But imagine, you have a paradox. It doesn't work. Listen to his words. Ulam. Now starts the answer. Ulam. Kol zehurak legabe ha'adam sheotachas hazman umusag hagdima v'ha'echer. This is only true by a person who lives in the realm of time and therefore there is the earlier and the later. The cause and the effect. First, last, one, two. When you're dealing with Hashem, who is beyond time, there is no before and after, which is a product of time. So two things can happen simultaneously, even though one is a cause for two and two is a cause for one. So when we're dealing with the Mizbeach, who's the Mizbeach? It's God's altar sacrificing to him. So here you say, the chatos is kosher. And the chatos sanctifies the altar. And the blood is good. And the fat is good. And you can burn it. Because it aklapi mizbeach. I, one, causes two, and two causes one, and one has to proceed. But in the world of Hashem, one and two can happen simultaneously, which is why your DM here is not a problem, because the past and the future are now, right now. So therefore, the Chatos makes the Mizbeach holy, which is number two, and the Mizbeach being holy becomes the cause for that which preceded it, which should come only after, because there's no Kedim and Ichur. Because it aklape mizbeach. Mashen kem linyan achilas adam. When it comes to a person eating the carbon, kivan shadam tachas musag akdim ava ichur. A person lives in the realm of time. V'lachei v'yishayich l'fi inyan asagasa bikdim ava ichur. Chaloi sasiba v'amesu v'yachat. In his realm, you can't have a siba and a mesuvav taking place simultaneously. So by a person, this is called a pasal lechatos. How do you want to make the carbon kosher? Because there's a kosher mizbeach. But the only way the mizbeach could become kosher is if the chatos is kosher. And the chatos can be kosher if the mizbeach is not kosher. For a person living in time, you can't have kashrus. 
that comes from something, that the kashrus is the cause of that something. You want the kashrus, right, to come when the whole kashrus is a result of that, of the mizbeach, which is a result of the kashrus. It can't happen. The divine realm, no problem. What happens later is earlier. What happens earlier becomes later. Topsy turvy. Legabi, the person you want me to eat it? How can I eat it as Apostle Lechatos? What do you mean it's Apostle Lechatos? You just burnt the blood. That's God's realm. The human realm, I say, I live in time, I'm sorry. The Daik hate of me, Think about this. Very, very well, says Rabbi Yosef Engel. Which now. Now brings us to a shtikl ragachavagon. Different sugya, different realm, but look how these things come together. The ragachavah has a pirush on chumash tzofnas paneach parshas lech lecha. You have it in your next source right after the Bios of Engel, page three, the third to the last paragraph, says the Pasuk in lech lecha. Avraham ben Tishim b'seisha shanim b'moyloi p'sara l'asay. Avraham was ninety-nine years old when his circumcision was done. What bothers Rashi? The grammar seems to be off. The Torah should have used the verb form. Why doesn't the Torah say Avraham was ninety-nine when he circumcised himself? Instead, the Torah says, Avram ben Tishim v'seijanim b'himoyloi, meaning he was 99 when circumcision was done. The active verb is so much more powerful. Why this term, b'himoyloi? The word familiar is completely in the passive form. Why not a simple active voice of a verb when Avram circumcised himself? The active voice is far more powerful. And Avram circumcised himself. Because the Torah says he circumcised himself. Says Rashi. Rashi says when circumcision was done. Zakir Rashi quoting a Medrash Rabbi in Lech Lecha. Not all Avram sakin. Avram took a knife. V'achaz bar lasay. And he held on to the foreskin. V'ratzalach he wanted to cut it. V'hoyam isyari shaya zakin. He was petrified. He was old. He was 99 years old. <laughs> to be able to do this skillfully, it's dangerous. Ma osa kodesh baruchu. What did Hashem do? Sholach yodoi v'ochaz imoi. Hashem sent forth his hand and held the knife together with Avram shenemar v'charois imoi habris. Loi loi nemar ele imoi. It doesn't say he made the covenant. For Avram Avinu. He cut the covenant with Avram Avinu. He was holding the knife. I want to now ask you a question. We know the famous cloud in Judaism. The Ran quotes it in a famous term. God doesn't make miracles in vain. The problem was Avram was petrified. Why couldn't he ask somebody to help him? There were no doctors in all of Eretz Yisrael. His friend Mamre, who told him to go ahead with it, get some help from somebody. This unique miracle of God showing up, holding the knife with him. It's, what does it mean, Hashem holding the knife with him? Hashem doesn't have a hand. So it's a metaphor. The metaphor is that God somehow protected him. God helped him. What's the idea of Chazal? He stretched out his hand, he held the knife with him, and he cut together with him. First of all, what do you need it for? You don't need something supernatural. Brisson are done every day. Avram could have had somebody help him under the circumstances. What's pshat? Comes the Rakachova gone, take a look. <laughs> and what he sees in this Rashi, and you're now going to have here four lines from the Rakachova, and take a look what's contained in these four lines. Rashi Kasa Viratza. He was afraid, and because he was afraid, Ma'asa Kadesh Barachuya. Ritsoi noi loi markach. Let me tell you what Rashi is really saying. Now, to see this in Rashi takes a Ragachavagon. 
The Zekvar Herachti I already wrote. The Kivun the Kaidem Milah Dayan Have Benoyach. We have a major problem. What's the problem? Till the bris mila, till the circumcision of Rome had the status of a Noachite. Ein Chagigid of Gimel, where the Gemara says, Avram, Amalekai Avram, Avram is Tchilo Legeirim. He is the first Geir in history, and it happened after the Bris Miller. Eich Ma'ani Shu Atzma Yasa Atzma Yisrael Aydei Atzma Yavai Ki Yachot. What's the issue? The issue is, take a look at your next source. Avoy the Zorad of Chavzayin Amad Aleph. You see the last source on page 3. How do you know that if a Gentile circumcises, circumcises a child, a person to become a convert? We all know the Gemara says in Yevamis, some of you just finished learning, Yevamis daf memvav, memzayin, the process of conversion requires three things. Mila, circumcision, tvila, mikveh, and the time of the base hamikdash, which doesn't apply today, hartsas, carbon, bringing a carbon. All three happened when the Jews became converts before Matan Torah. Avram Avinu had to go through a Geras. The first thing was Mila. The Gemara says in Avayda Zara, what if a Gentile does the Mila for the convert? It's possible. How do you know? Hashem tells Avram and Lech Lecha, you have to guard my covenant. In other words, the one to perform a bris has to be you, a Jew. Rabbi Yechimim says, Himo, Himo, says twice, Himo, Himo, why the redundancy about Avram Avinu? To teach me a special limud that the miller has to happen through a Jew. I don't understand. The whole source that miller for Geirus, and according to many also regular bris, even not for Geirus, but that's a separate discussion. Here it's conversion. Has to happen only through a Jew. Is from where? From Avram Avinu. Himo, himo. Avram Avinu became a Jew as a result of the Miller. So when he was doing the Miller, he wasn't a Jew yet. So we have a paradox. The only way the Miller could make him a Jew is if the Miller happens through a Jew. The only way the Miller can happen through a Jew is if there is a Miller <laughs> which makes him a Jew. But for the Mila to make him a Jew, it has to happen through a Jew. So you have either one, two, two, one, Sibba Masuv of paradox. You get it? Avram has to become a gay. How does he become a gay? Through Mila. The Mila has to be through a Jew. So the cause for making him a Jew is that the Mila happens through a Jew. So that's the Sibba, that's the Masuv. But the only way the Mila can happen through a Jew is if you have number two. Before number one, which means he's a Jew, which comes after number one. And now it has to precede number one. How does that work? The Psukim, how him from the very Psukim of Aram, he is the foundation of all Bris Miller, and from his what Hashem told him, you according to both Shittas and Avaida Zara, Dorubar Papa and Rabbi Yechina, from those Psukim themselves, asked the Rakachova. Now, now it's interesting. The Ramban asks the question, but on something else. You know what the Ramban asks? The Ramban says it says that Avram Avinu circumcised his family, including Yishmael, right? Before himself, if it was before himself, he wasn't Jewish. <laughs> the Ramban doesn't even ask the question about Avram himself. Say he circumcised himself before Yishma. So he was a Jew, and Yishma's circumcision was kosher. Glot. But what about Avram himself? This nobody raises till the Rekha that I saw. So now look at his answer. <laughs> yeah. What does Jewish mean in those days? Fine, good question. What's the definition of Gerim? So in Chagigad of Gimel, Avram is defined as Tchilo Legerim. However, the definition of Gerim then was, obviously there's different Gedarim of Gerim before Matan Teira, after Matan Teira, but there was a certain element of Gerim, and you see it from the question of the Ramban. So that's the question. According to the Gerim then, he didn't even have that Gerim until the Miller. But the Miller is not effective if it's not done through a Jew. It's like he didn't have it. So how does he become a Jew to make the Milo effective? The problem again is, Siba Mesuvav. Siba is the source, Mesuvav is the result. The result is dependent on the source. Without the source, you can't have the result, but without the result, you don't have the source to make the result. And for the Rakat Listen to his words now. 
What Rabbi Yosef Engel writes in his language, the Rakachava writes in his language. Ach be'emes zeh ha-geder rak ba-hakadosh baruchu. You're right. This geder of Sibam and Mesubah happening simultaneously is only by Hashem. Why? Listen, three words. Atzmus ha-etzem v'hayichud. Because he is the essence of essence and oneness. Kamosh HaKasav Rabbeinu and when the Rakachava says Rabbeinu, who's Rabbeinu? He had one Rebbe, the Rambam. Kamosh HaKasav Rabbeinu b'moira u b'sefer amad. Which Rambam is he referring to? Hilchis Yisaydi Atayra and Hilchis Tshuva Yidiyu Bchira. What does the Rambam say? God's knowledge is not like our knowledge. Which is why his knowledge is not a contradiction to free choice. Because who are your idea? Who am I? Who are your dua hakalach? By a human being, the Rambam says, the human being, his mind and the wisdom that you acquire are three separate things. By Hashem, he is the knower, he is the instrument of knowledge, and he is the wisdom. So he says, since he's atzmus ha'etzem v'hayichud, and he knows reality, not from reality, but from himself, because everything comes from him. So therefore it's oneness. So therefore there's no distinction. So therefore there's no sibil mesuvav. So the cause and the result can happen simultaneously. So even though for Avram's miller to be effective, he has to be Jewish. And for him to be Jewish, he has to be circumcised. But for him to be circumcised, he has to be Jewish. In Atzmos HaEtzem V'Hayichud, in God's world, the two can happen simultaneously, transcending time. So the cause and the sequence happen together. So Avram Avinu, being Jewish, and circumcising himself to make himself Jewish, which makes it a good miller, happens simultaneously. And this is what Rashi meant. That's what it means Hashem was holding Avram's hand and helping him cut it. It wasn't in order to protect him simply physically. What Avram was afraid was, according to the Yagachav, you know what he was afraid of? He was afraid of, he's going to cut and he, nothing is going to happen. That's what he was afraid of. If he was afraid of the medicine, he could have checked himself into Cornell. What no, once Avram is Jewish, you don't need that anymore. Once Avram is Jewish, and Son is Jewish, so Yitzchak is Jewish, now everybody can be circumcised. That's what the Rukh Shabbat says, you can't say the Basachas. Only, that's when Hashem took his hand and held a knife. What does it mean he held a knife? It doesn't mean stam a miracle. It means that this was an act that Hashem, so to speak, took under his jurisdiction, beyond time, Right? According to Pirkei Rebbe, it happened in Kippur, which is Achaz Bashana. Achaz Bashana. It's a Nekuda also beyond Zman. We'll soon see in a moment what Shuvah. And therefore, it can happen simultaneously with Sibah and Mesuvah converge. So Avram circumcises himself. As a result of that, he becomes Jewish. As a result of it being Jewish, it's a valid circumcision happening simultaneously. And then the Raga Chava adds, V'chein hadin gabe get. The same halacha you have by divorce. What's the halacha by divorce? Gita v'achatzeira boyim kiyachat. Same paradox. For her to be divorced, it has to be her chatzer. Right? So the chatzer has to be hers first. That's the sibba. The mesuvah is the get. <laughs> but for the chatzer to be hers, it has to follow the get. So the get has to precede the chatzer. By get it cannot. Why by get? Why by get? By Mila, Hashem holds his hand. Why by get? Where is God? Listen to these words. Ein Yerushalmi perekal of the Kiddushin, Gabel HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yichet Shmoy. And now you got to figure this out. So take a look in Yerushalmi. Page 2, your top source. Page 2, your top source. Zog de Heleke Yerushalmi Kiddushin perekal of Allah Chalaf. We know halacha that the laws of kiddushin, the way they govern Jewish life, don't exist by Gentiles. It's a different process. The Rambam discusses in Hilchis issues how Gentiles get married, and their marriage is valid, but it's not a Jewish. It's not. It's not the same definition of a Jewish marriage between a Jewish husband and a Jewish wife. What about divorce? Zog the Yerushalmi. There's a pasuk in Malachi. In Malachi, Berg Beis, 
God admonished, the prophet admonishes the Jewish people for betraying their wives. Famous Gemara at the end of Gittin, somebody who divorces his first wife, the Mizbeach weeps for him, for the couple, and he brings the Pasig here, where you betrayed Ashish Nurecha, your first wife, you know they say, Amaisa, that a woman came to a Rav, she wanted a get. So the Rav said, you've been married 40 years, so that's why I want a get. He says, the Gemara says, that if you get a get, the Mizbeach will start crying. She says, 40 years, I was crying. the Mizbeach vein in Abyssal. 40 years, I was crying. Let the altar cry a little bit. Zog the Yerushalmi. The Pasuk says, Ki sonei shilach v'goymer ades Hashem alakei Yisro. The, the Navi admonishes the Jew who hates his wife and sends her away, divorces her. Betraying a covenant by the God of Israel. The Pasuk uses Elikei Yisra. The concept of divorce is connected to the God of Israel. Throughout Malachi, Hashem is called Hashem Tzvois. The God of the legions here, he's called the God of Israel. To teach us that Gerish and two, the laws of Allah, the Allah is by divorce also apply to the Jewish people. Meaning, what does this mean? We know the Gemara says in Saita, Ish right? A man and a woman who have a good marriage, Shalom is the Shechina is there. They say, Rabbi Shalom is Oyerbach. Zatzal, he was, the Talmudim were walking home with him from Kol Torah, Yeshiva Kol and before he went into his house, he straightened out his tie and his kapote and his hat. So one of the Talmudim said, Rebbe, he asked him from his arm, I don't understand, usually when people are leaving the house to go to their workplace, that's when they straighten themselves up. When you're going home, now is the time to relax. You know, you take off your tie, you take off your jacket. So Rebbe Shlom Zalman told his Talmudim, he says, in my house, Baruch Hashem, this Shalom bias. There's real peace. The Gemara says, When are the Shalom Bayis, the Shechina is in my house. So when I'm walking into my house, I'm going to be Makabu Pnei Ashchina. I'm welcoming the Shechina, therefore I have to be dressed appropriately, like when you go into a shul. So the power of Kiddushin is not just two people get married. Marriage is a divine, sacred institution. Not just we want to get married. This kedushin that created ish v'ish's yud and hey together, you take out the yud of ish to hey of ish, and you have ish, as the Gemara says in Soite Daf Yud Zayin. So it's a divine institution. Kedushin is something unique that brings two people and unifies two souls as one. It's a divine reality, and therefore it has to be treated with the respect that you treat a divine institution. Just like if somebody is davening Shmuel Esr. And they have a telephone call. You're not going to disturb them in the middle of Shemina Esra and say you have a telephone call because it's a sacred moment between them and God. If you see a couple together, to do something that can interrupt the relationship is like taking away somebody in the middle of Shemina Esra because Shechina Shechuyah B'nei. The Shechina is there. Divorce, therefore, is commensurate. Divorce is taking and transforming that state. It's not stama, a symbolic thing. We give a paper, you're free. God is directly involved in the Kiddushin and therefore in the Gerushin. That's why by get, you have Shnei Dvarim Abayim Kiyechot. The Ksais HaChoshin's question, why doesn't it work when I give you my house with a document inside? That's a human transaction. But get and Kiddushin, these are divine transactions. It's Hashem is holding the knife. If Hashem is holding the knife, Simba and Mesuvav can happen simultaneously. I don't mean to compare a bris to a get, but God is holding the knife. So Simba and Mesuvav happen simultaneously. Where? By Gitim, by Kiddushin. Where else does it happen? Where else does it happen? By Karbonus, on the Mizbah. Not when you have to eat it. Where else? By Kalim. The Kalim that Moshe Rabbeinu anointed are holy. After that, what makes them holy? The Avoida. What is that? It's the Avoida in the base Hamigdash. It's not the human realm, it's God's realm. If it's God's realm, Shnei Dvarim Abayim Kiyachot. That's what the Rambam tells us. Atzmus Ha'atzim Vayichut. So the contradiction of Yudin and Pchira is reconciled here because the choice is happening right now.
There's no future. Number two is together with number one. So you have get, where else? By Eved. What happens as a result of the Eved going free? What happens? He becomes a Jew. He becomes a Ger. He goes into the realm of Kedusha Sam Yisrael. It's a different realm. That's what the, the Beis Haritzer writes over there later on. Dr. Chava doesn't say that, but that's what the Beis Haritzer says. But we understand this from the Dr. Chava, because it's similar to Avram Avinu going into conversion. So Hashem is holding the knife. So there too you could say, Shnei Dvarim, Abayim Kiechav. So we don't just take the Svara, Shnei Dvarim, and say, okay, it happened simultaneously. It doesn't happen simultaneously. When you go into a different zone, when you transcend the space of time, in the divine realm, there these two things can happen simultaneously. Over there we don't say it. The Mishra Shiduk doesn't say it at the end. It doesn't happen together. But this, I was bringing it out to show how, how, the, the, how the paradox works. So now, now let's finally bring this together. You all know there's an expression, Ein Mukdam Umoche Batayra. Right, what does it mean? <laughs> Literally it means, you can't take Torah always in a chronological order. Where does Rashi say we learn it out from? Remember? Parshas Baloischa. The beginning of Bamidba starts off that on the Rosh year, a year after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, Hashem told Moshe to count the Jews. Two Parshas later in Parshas Baloischa, what does it say? That that Rosh Chodesh Nisan, a year after the Exodus, Hashem told the Jews, V'yasu b'nei Yisrolas ha-Pesach And then the people came and said, We're Tomei, they couldn't do it. So Hashem, Loma Nigo, it's not fair. Because the whole group of the Jews that could not offer the sacrifice, when? The second Pesach, after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. So Hashem gave them a Pesach Sheni. So Rashi says, the beginning of Bamid is Rosh Chodesh Eir. Parshas Baal is Rosh Chodesh Nisan. From here, Lamadita, you learn, She'ein Muktam Amoche Batayr. In Torah, there's no before and there's no after. Literally, we understand it chronologically. But based on this word, we understand the new depth. Ein Muktam Amoche Batayr. In the realm of Torah's Hashem, there's no Kedima and Ichor. What was before is not before. What was after does not have to be after. The after and the before can merge as one. Why? Because in the world of Torah beyond Zman, the Siba Mesuv could be Boim Kiechot. Which according to this, according to this, Zavart I once heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, why you learn out Ein Muktam Amul Chabat from Pesach Sheni. Because this is what Shuva really means. When was Avram's circumcision? Pekid Rebbe when? Which day? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day of Shuva. What's Shuva? The Gemara says in Yumadav Pevav, when you do Shuva, Nekar Avoinoi Mitchilose. The sin is uprooted as though it never was. What do you mean? I sinned 10 years ago. Today I did Shuva. How is the sin from 10 years ago uprooted as though it never happened? You could say, you're forgiven. What do you mean it never happened? Of course it happened. <laughs> if you punched me in my nose and you bruised me, a lady asked me forgiveness, it never happened? Of course it happened. I may forgive you, and of course it happened. What's that? Nekar avoyman mitchilosoy. And then furthermore, the Shlokish says, doinois nasoloy kezachis. The sins can become mitzvahs. The pshat is, What's tshuva? Tshuva is going into the realm of dveikus with Hashem. In that realm, the parameter of time dissolves. If the parameters of time dissolve, Hashem is holding the knife with Avram Avinu, so then the future can completely become integrated with the past, and it can redefine the past, because in that realm, So ein muktam What were they saying? We didn't do Pesach. We missed opportunity. What does Pesach Sheni say? It's never too late. What does it mean it's never too late? You made terrible mistakes in your life. It's never too late. You could say, I won't do it in the future. But what happened, happened. I'm sorry, but it happened. Ein Muktam Amulcha teaches you the power of Tshuva. The power of Tshuva is to redefine not only the future, but even the past. To go back into the past, because in Torah, 
What was doesn't have to be relegated to the past, and what is is not the future. Beyond time, and when you can go into the realm beyond time, you can redefine the experience of the past, not as a sin, but as a prerequisite to a deeper type of tshuva. Meaning, as a result of the sin, it caused you to do a new type of tshuva, so now you redefine the sin in the retroactively as kizachias. That's Ein Muktam Mukhabatarina. So this is one example how the Yidiyam Pira, Rambam, and all the Rishonim who explain it in terms of Ava Hava Asid plays itself out in the realm of Halacha in Shnei Dvarim Habayim Kechat. Have a wonderful week. <laughs> make sure you make the right choices this week. Next Sunday, Amir Tzah Hashem, there is a Shia 9.30. Actually, your mother becomes a mother, but you're being born. Right. So it's born Kechat? But not a person. No. The person was there before. Yeah, but this whole thing with the the complication that he was mal himself, it could have been avoided. Not sure, because, um, how? How? <laughs> because so a woman doesn't need to have the, the actual... Uh, a woman could be told, but she can be, uh, become a girl. But there's another machlaikas in poskim, even by a regular bris, if an isha is kshayra. You know, there's a machlaikas in poskim. Even a regular bris, not even conversion... There's two shittas in Shulchan Aruch, if an ish is kosher or not. A woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying it's also problematic. It wouldn't answer the question. No, she could become a Jew. But the Mila, even with a regular child, is a shayla if an ish is kosher. No. But I'm telling you that even a regular bris is a shayla if an ish can do it. Certainly Gators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look in Hilchus Mila, yeah. Yeah. So yes, everything is you're still making choices. And you're being and you're being getting scar is based on your choices. I have the gates of order. He's telling me I shouldn't be able to me or I shouldn't have me. If I decide not to, then I'm gonna be punished for my bad choice. If I decide to do it, I'm gonna be rewarded for my good choice. And 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 it's not much to tell with this right. so they're bunch of So what? So fine. And and if and if I try to I can't have guessing, but I'm gonna MS. That's not good, but their taina was that if the Rebbeinu Shalolam knows, it excludes, it means you think you're choosing, you're not really choosing. But I am still making a, I'm still, I'm still struggling. Listen, if a rock, if you throw a rock off a building, okay, and the rock as it's flying down, thinks it has free choice to go further. If it, if we all understand or a child is on a, on, on a slide yes, and he thinks he's choosing. But, but he doesn't. Still, but he's, he's not choosing because he might right. be predetermined. But he's still making but, choices. He's struggling. He can't take away no, the no, no. But the Shaila is this. If he, if he was really mukhrich to do this, even if he didn't know, but if he was mukhrich, so why are you punishing him? The, the, so you're the, saying... The of Bria, right, is that we should, we should grow through right, the Rebbeinu wants it, wants to be made of us by 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 having us by, by having us grow through our choices, right? We make a good choice. We're 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 growing. We're growing. If we make a poor choice, we're going backwards. That's the mitzvah. That we're saying that the the, the 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 process of our bechira, even if it's chal shul is a, is, a, is a process that helps us. So your your answer your answer. Ma'amas, there's no bechira. Pragmatically, say there's no bechira. But since the person feels this bechira, so if he decided to do the right thing, he should get rewarded. And if he decided to do the wrong thing, even though if he would have decided to do the right thing, he really wouldn't have a choice. What would happen? Yeah. But because in his, one, one second, yeah, true, but does Hashem know about that struggle? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's so that you have a shine about that struggle. Why? Why? I'm because that struggle itself is predetermined. He knows which way I'm going to go. No, 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 but no, no. That doesn't mean that I. If you're conditioned in a way 
that your machshav is going to say, I'm going anyway. And my machshav is going to say, I'm not going anyway. If you're conditioned that way, so then there's no reason you should be rewarded, I should be punished. Think about it. <laughs> Unless you exclude his knowledge from something, then I have no problem. Right. Unless you say, he knows the result, but the struggle is yours. But it's not. It's all preconditioned. Imagine it's chemical. Forget about knowledge. Right. Let's say you're chemically designed, or you grew up with a mother, that naturally when you're going to struggle, you're going to say, I'm going out of bed. And another person is chemically designed, he's going to be lazy. So it's not schaiva inish. They may struggle, but thus gufa. That gufa is all predetermined. Well, by the way, he gives certain people certain ideas. In a chanami. In a chanami. The shalas do we ultimately have khira. The fact that there's a lot of things we don't have khira that no less man the public. We don't have khira whether to be born, we don't have khira where to grow up, we don't have khira whether to be Jew. That's of course. The shalas do we have khira on anything. So that's the problem. If there's a idea about that struggle, gufa, so even the details of that struggle, we're just living out a script. So if we're living out a script, there's no schari noinish, whatever, regardless. How gufa that I struggle and I'm like, wow, this is hard, but I'm doing it. And you say it's hard and therefore I'm not doing it. How gufa, why did I respond this way and you responded this way? Okay, so it was like somehow my brain, my my neurological system says this. So it's my fault I was born this way. Or to put it in these terms, if Hashem knew it, in other words, He determined it because it's absolute. So we're just playing out a script. That's the Vart. You understand? You get it? No, even the Hergish, even that Hergish that you took, flex good. But even that Hergish is already. Uh, you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Gvaldik. Mesari Shaya Zakain and therefore there's an Avar Hoiven Asid. And as a result of that, he can't be mal himself to make a gairis. Beautiful. Go ahead. Beautiful. Um, it's going to take a while. Go ahead. First of all, Aleichem Shalom. We spent time together, basically, with the Frankish. Should I shoot this? I'm from Freak. We email each other as well. Remember? Yeah, yeah. Question on the first of all, I learned today on the Karbanas. If it happened on the first day, why do we need another six days? Why the other six days do we have to take it outside of the Mach? No, good question. The answer is, in other words, throughout the eight days, it was a process that took eight days. So it was also... It's like uh, if somebody's being vaccinated, you know? It takes eight days. It's a procedure that takes eight days, and as, at the end, it's all done. So it's even bigger than get. get it happens at the same time over here. Right. It happened... Very so good. Our brain seems like eight days, but for Hashem... It's Very good. Again. But you're saying even the first day, they could sprinkle the blood... Or you could say that each day there was a Kedusha enough for that day. That's the Pashtus. Now that each day the, 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 the Zrikas Dam made a Kedusha that was sufficient for that day to make the carbon kosher. The next day you needed another process. And then each day was independent. But then as a result of eight days accumulative, it can be done for... Bruchem to you. Sorry. A few notes. Sorry to bother you. Yeah. Who knows? First off, the idea of the realm about the Bukhi is uh, yeah. past is present, present is future. It's all the same. That's the Kapadisha Malai. Yeah. Which is very well. Yeah. If that, just as to be moist to you, you know, you can keep in the same street as Om Chabad. Amer Kadaim Nain Ayikas Chabad, the Yudian Mas, or the Zochim Malchi Shaim Amicha. When you come to the Shem Avai, you can do Tshuva, because it's a Niyah Vai, a Kodim Shech, a Niyah Vai, a Lach Shech, a Dev Nasim. That's one thing. Another thing, on the Rav Shavu's fact, that he said the Kedushim is different, uh, I don't know, the Rav, I guess the Rav Shavu doesn't bring it down, but the Yemudah condition itself, the Yemudah terms, Dav Avu, Dav Be'ez, and Mubayz, we talk about Kedushim. Very good, very good. Very good. By Salaivi says, in Pashas Chikas, the reason why a Geh has to have a Bezim for Toivo, because you make him a Klashuris. A Geh becomes a Klashuris. Very good. It's the same idea. So that's for that. 
now for the chest, the cheskene, which bothers me. The what? The the cheskene, cheskene. Cheskene. Here, by the Mishkan, there was the shem on the Mishkan. There really was mekadosh. It wasn't the avoid. It was the shem on Mishkan that he actually sprayed. That should have made it a mezbayich. That's a little... No, but it says clearly in Perik Choftes at the end that from the par, by sprinkling the blood on the mezbayich, the chitesas on mezbayich. Oh, it says that. So we got to understand that. Right. So you want to know what why, is... Yeah. Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not that? So the base of Oitzer continues a whole shankal of Atariya. If the chizkuni is right, that it was completely dependent on the carbon... Yeah, and therefore, if you can even say that, that, that without that, there was no there was no yeah, On top of it, we also have to understand the whole idea that the Kahanam are really by themselves. The Kahanam were technically a machloek, a shlicha da rachmun, a shlicha da dan. If you say shlicha da rachmun, and m'shilchim kevoi kezuchin, then the whole eating is part of a carbon, which is also m'shilchim kevoi. There is no concept of right. technically right. as the body of the embodiment. Right. It's really, really... That's the two things. Beautiful. You're saying if it's Shluch Hedir Achmona, so when they're eating it, it's Mishulch and Gavoya, so on. Then it's technically the, the part of the eating is... It says, Kenoitel Pras Me Beis HaMelech. So if it's right. Neutel Pras Me Beis HaMelech, so the king is giving it to you. Right. Right. You it could be what Rabbi Yosef Engel means, in other words... I don't know. you got to understand Right. That ultimately... Ultimately, eating is human consumption, and and that. human consumption can't happen. Uh, can't happen. Ah, uh, that the eating was also. Right, right. You're saying if uh, if there's a chila, it's a part of the kedusha. Yeah. It could be when you eat something, yeah. it's damo basa kipsara. You're consuming it into your system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you so, so biologically, it's that way, uh-huh. and intellectually, it assimilates into your system. The only and the lekach and the aunt, the base aitzu says emes. It's it's a shlichus from Hashem and shlucha de rachman and it's neutral pras me base amelach. But to say that the human being can can in- integrate and internalize into his system this Sibbe and Mesilov together, that's not Shaykh. In other words, to, to take it in the Pnimius, Achila, to do the Avoid uh, as part of the Shlichus, yeah. But to be a Shliach in Achila, in other words, that that becomes part of my Pnimius, that's not possible. Could be. Yeah, the Kashra carbon. He's sprinkling the blood. Like Gabe Achila, this Mesilov follows the Sibbe and therefore you can't eat it. Huh? It's not, of course it's not a regular carbon. It could be Moisef. No, it made him as Be'ach holy. Yeah, so, so after that, he could be Makavol Kabonis. Unusual Chalim. Yeah. So one thing to be Moisef, the Kahanam might have not been fully Kahanam at that time. Considering they might not, because at that right. time, Moshe technically did avoid that. Right. They were still being trained, anointed. anointed. You're saying since they weren't if complete they, they Kayanim, they weren't so it's not completely Shluchim de Rachmana. Very good. So it's good. So good. I always heard that Rabbi Shabbat is great, but I never really saw it. I'm telling you, I hope we'll have a Rabbi Shabbat every day. This is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Robert, yeah. This is unbelievable. Yeah. How you do Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I, I, I look at it myself, I'll never get to that. So we hope to have a Rabbi Shabbat. Sar HaToyda. Sad Hatayda. We did the we did the Vayechi one. You were here. Marisa Machpela. With a lot of people. I think I went to Marisa Machpela that the next mm-hmm. week, and and the bus ran with me, and I showed it to the people that go there. Tom was seeing every Friday. And I showed them this. He said, "Cook here, Tom. I kind of high steppers. I kind of the Cook with the eyes. They got all excited. Achere kavre yisavah.